Welcome to our last topic in the, the polar section, and uh, certainly reason to celebrate. Uh, you either love them or hate them, and uh, I certainly find the polar graphs intriguing. It's definitely a different way of thinking, um, and yet certainly challenging. So our topic today is arc length, and it's uh, kind of like, I'd like to call it the shoelace principle. You know, imagine I had the ability to take a string or a shoelace and just lay it along the outer rim of this curve and then take that shoelace to straighten it out, pull it nice and tight, and measure it and find out exactly how long this curve is. Well, we have quite the formula coming at us today, and we actually have a special arc length formula. Let's go back and review what we did with rectangular coordinates. <clears throat> And that's going to kind of propel us forward as we try to find the length of our polar graphs. Um, we might have had a curve that maybe looked like this or something like that. And we said, you know, can we find the A length from, you know, a certain interval from A to B, something like that. What we did is we took that finite interval and we broke it into an infinite uh, number of tiny line segments. Um, in fact, we started with this idea. We said, okay, just finding the distance from there to there. We said we're going to kind of build a triangle. And we said, um, let's call that L, we'll call this X, we'll call this Y. Do you remember we used to say L squared was really X squared plus Y squared, going back to the old Pythagorean theorem. And we said L is really going to be the square root of all of that. And then we said, well, we want that triangle to be infinitely small. We want it to be so, 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 so tiny. So we said the length of one really li tiny line segment, um, we said the change in x is going to get infinitely small and we also said the change in y is going to get infinitely small and, and then we did some other manipulations to that but do you recall the formula that we ended up coming up with so we said the length of a curve once you added all those infinitely tiny line segments together was the integral from a to b of the square root and then inside that radical we would have said one plus the derivative of function f squared okay so now I wish I could go through that the entire proof with you with regards to polars but I just this is a kind of my executive decision I don't think it's worthwhile to be honest with you I mean there's certainly some value in it but I want to kind of just cut to the chase here and and with regards to a polar graph okay and we're gonna have to keep these two formulas straight so the arc length of a polar curve looks like this okay let's we can still use the L if you want we'll say the integral from alpha to beta those will represent the um, the, the angles and it is going to be a big square root and this time it's the original R squared plus the derivative of R with respect to theta squared so it's very, very similar in the sense like you still have the derivative of your function getting squared here. The only thing that really changes is right here, instead of saying 1 squared, it's actually an r squared. So again, it's nothing more than uh, you know, a new formula to memorize. We'll practice it, and hopefully with, with that practice, it'll be much simpler to memorize. So for our first example, let's just go with the cardioid we had on the last screen. r equals 1 plus the cosine of theta. And let's see if we can find the, the length of this entire cardioid. Um, just uh, You kind of got that visual image in your mind already from the last slide. And we're just going to jump right in. Um, let's say that the length is going to be, it did take us two pi radians to complete the entire thing. Again, if we were doing just a circle like r equals cosine by itself, we'd go zero to pi. We've got that big gigantic radical. Um, the first thing is going to be r squared. Okay, plus the derivative squared. We'll throw that d theta on the end. Now, ironically, a lot of times this is a setup only type of question. This particular one, though, they would they're going to clean it up a little bit because something interesting and special happens. It once let's go ahead and foil that one out. Let's see, what are we going to get if we foil that out? We got one plus two cosine of theta plus cosine squared. And then on the second term, we get just sine squared. And what you'll notice is you see the Pythagorean identity right there. So if we combine those two terms, that becomes a 1. And that was the cleanup that I was talking about. 
And then if you combine that one with the first term, we now have 2 plus 2 cosine. Now, going any further by, by hand is very unrealistic because of the radical sign. And this is probably how they would express their multiple choice option um, in this regard for the arc length of that cardioid. Our next one, we're going to talk about, instead of the length of the entire curve, let's find just the length of the inner loop for the curve r equals 1 plus 2 cosine of theta. So we've got a nice limicon with the inner loop, and let's see what this rascal would look like. Let's see, it's going to start all the way out here at 3. It's going to shoot up to 1, and then negative 1, and then 1. And so our curve looks like this. And they want just the length of that inner loop. Now remember, when we first entered that inner loop, we, we entered it from this angle and we swung up to there. So what I'm really looking forward, what I've got to try to figure out is when did that inner loop start and when did it end? All we're really doing is setting that function equal to zero, asking ourselves when did cosine, when does cosine equal negative one half? We could say at, um, let's see, reference angle of 60, so it looks like 2 pi over 3 is when the inner loop started, and then 4 pi over 3 is when the inner loop ended, and uh, we're just going to write an integral that has those bounds on it. Just like all those area problems, getting the correct bounds is 90% of the problem here. Uh, good news is we do not have a coefficient with, on this formula, like the area one we always had to remember, that pesky one-half in front. I don't want you to accidentally throw a one-half on these. So it's going to be r squared, so 1 plus 2 cosine of theta squared, plus the derivative squared. And again, we could FOIL out that first one and, and maybe combine some like terms and take care of take advantage of the Pythagorean theorem. But I'm going to leave it right there. I just want to make sure we got the correct bounds on it. And we've got the r squared plus the uh, derivative of r with respect to theta squared. For our last one today, let's try to find the length of just one pedal on the curve r equals 8 cosine of 3 theta. Again, the, the amplitude is 8, which is rather large, uh, but the frequency is a 3, and that's what really makes things even more interesting. Because that 3 is an odd number, we're going to see exactly 3 pedals. Um, if we were to graph this function, rectangularly speaking, let's say there's pi over 2, and there's pi, and there's 3 pi over 2, and there's 2 pi. And then what we like to do is we like to break that into smaller increments. We go 30, 60, 90, 120. Uh, 150, 180, 210, 240, 270, 300, 330, etc., etc. Now that first curve has to be completed by the time I get right to that hash mark right there. So we're going to start up high at 8, we'll cross at 30 degrees or pi over 6, we'll dip down to negative 8, we'll cross again and finish up here. And then we can continue that pattern on and on and on. But let's see if we can transfer that over to a decent polar graph here. So we're starting way over here at 8, and then we're quickly, we hit that pole pretty quick. So there's half of my, my pedal, and that's what I want to focus on. I want to find the length of that half a pedal and then double it. You'll notice that this x-intercept corresponds to when we hit the pole right there. So I'm going to say that the length of that portion is the integral from, let's see here, we started at 0 and we hit it, 30 degrees or pi over 6. We've got the original function squared plus his derivative, negative 24. Wow, there's some good chain rule right there. Never know when you're going to use that chain rule. His derivative squared. And then now what I'm going to do is I'm now going to double that answer to take into account this lower half um, that I wouldn't have seen till much, much later. Remember, that lower half doesn't come in until the very end. If I was graphing that entire rose petal, I would actually come here. I would swoop down there, swoop up, and then I wouldn't finish that petal until the very, very end. One of the interesting notes there. 
But anyway, this will do it right there. I got your R squared. I got your R prime squared. We got the correct bounds. So hopefully that makes sense. The number one thing I've got to tell you tonight is to memorize that formula. Let's really cover it up, see if you remember it, do it a few times. Make sure we come in tomorrow with that formula securely memorized.